Welcome back. I'm Brandon, the H Bar Bull. I'm going to be doing this one on my own again. Hopefully, Zepp is going to be back for us next week. I do want to make it clear I do some contract work for the H Bar Foundation, but I don't do these weekly updates in any official capacity. I'm just coming to you personally to give you the latest in the Hedera ecosystem. But as always, none of this is financial advice. Use it for entertainment or educational purposes only. So we have a lot to get in today. I think one of the big things is I have an interview with Graham. He is the CEO of Archax to get a little bit more into the tokenization of that BlackRock fund. But first, I want to get into something that I had a space on this past Monday. So we've been following Bank Social really closely, and they just had some big news that came out. First of all, they were trying to create a credit union called the DeFi Credit Union, a, a native Web3 credit union to give banking services to those that are working in our space. We, we know that has been an issue. We've heard about things like Choke Point 2.0, Operation Choke Point 2.0, and one of the things that has kind of been done there is limiting banking services for crypto businesses. And to get something like a credit union that would allow for these kind of banking services would be invaluable. And they had gone through the process and gotten the approvals from the regulator of credit unions, the NCUA, on all of the Web3 aspects that they wanted to integrate. The next step was to get their federal charter. And they don't actually have to go through that step because another credit union has shown interest. That credit union is the Connects Federal Credit Union. They kind of want to merge or work together with Bank Social to create this DeFi credit union. And why is this important? Well, obviously, it's for those banking services. But some of the other things that I'm really interested in is on-ramps and off-ramps for things like stable coins. You know, we already have USDC within the Hedera ecosystem, but we can't necessarily get that USDC out to US dollars or the other way around. The reason for that is Coinbase, which I think is an great company, doesn't yet support the Hedera version of USDC. Well, if we were to have that on and off ramp in another place, that would make life a lot easier for a lot of the businesses that are trying to build within the Hedera ecosystem. Now, an entity like the DeFi Federal Credit Union could certainly support the swapping of something like USDC into US dollars, but actually Bank Social already has a stablecoin called Rivia, and it really doesn't matter what stablecoin we're using as long as it's, it's trusted and you can swap those into US dollars and you can swap US dollars into those stable coins and then bring them into our DeFi ecosystem. We would just need to get liquidity up a little bit on that Rivia stable coin. Now, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. There's still a few steps that need to take place before we have these banking services at our fingertips. It almost sounds too good to be true. So I certainly want to get some more information on this. But at each point along the way, it seems like Bank Social is doing the right things. A great example of that is they just sent their COO, Becky, up to Washington, D.C., who engaged with others that are working within the Hedera ecosystem, like Nilmini, and we've seen her doing some great work as well. But they're engaging with the government government and regulators up there in Washington. So that was fantastic to see. They're also pioneering things like DREC. They are building a consortium of credit unions, and we've heard Lehman talk about how you need helpers to allow you to do that decentralized recovery. And these credit unions might be very well positioned to do that. So they're exploring that as well. Now, I certainly want to follow this really closely and get more information. I'm sure you guys want more information as well. So we're getting John, the CEO of Bank Social, on next Monday. In addition to getting the Connects Federal Credit Union, that's the other credit union that's going to be partnering up to create this DeFi credit union. We're going to get them on next Monday to answer some additional questions, and we're going to follow this really closely going into the future. All right, so the next thing we want to get into is something that came out of Coinbase. What we saw just announced is that HBAR is going to get perpetual futures on that exchange. And this is really good for getting additional liquidity for our ecosystem. And I'm hoping the next step for Coinbase will be to start to support HTS tokens. It's going to be a big step once we see the first HTS token supported. We also saw something come out of PayPal. It's really around MoonPay, but PayPal is going to support a lot more crypto currencies. That's pretty much all the cryptocurrencies that are supported by MoonPay. But the nice thing is HBAR is one of those tokens. So people are going to have another on-ramp within the Hedera ecosystem. All right. So again, the big story that we are still following is Archax tokenizing that BlackRock money market fund. I needed to get some more information on this. So I caught up with Graham. He is the CEO of Archax to give us some more information.
Graham, thank you for stopping by. We really appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, we're going to dive right into it. Graham, as is the case for many in the Hedera space, I've been following the Archax developments really closely. But to start, can you just explain what Archax is and what you and your team have put together? Sure. Yeah, no worries. So I guess, you know, at a high level, we're a regulated exchange custodian and broker. We're regulated by the FCA, the main regulator here in London. And we also have our crypto asset registration. So we were the first to get those in the UK. So we're fully regulated and registered to do most things in securities and crypto. Been working on it for six years now, building out the infrastructure, raising money, getting the reg permissions. And as you've seen most recently, we've just started to launch products. So really the last six months has been about bringing those tokenized products to market. It's really exciting. We're, we're happy to see what's happening there. So obviously, there was some massive news last week with the tokenization of a BlackRock money market fund. Can you explain who the players are in that and that announcement in a little bit more detail? Sure, no worries. Yeah, so we've, um, you know, we have this big belief that every asset in the future is moving on chain, every equity, debt, fund. Uh, my background's in hedge funds and asset management, so familiar with that space. One of the assets that I think needs to be brought up to speed with new technology so one of the places that that we went first of all for digitizing uh, a lot of asset managers have been looking at tokenization of funds considering which funds make sense and money market funds has struck a chord with a lot of those investment managers being as stable coins have been stable coin issuers have been earning a lot of money off of the interest obviously uh, and money market funds are very much like stable coins in that they could be transferred, they hold a value of one, but these obviously yield interest. Now, kind of seeing this use case, we've been speaking to many investment managers about creating tokenized money market funds. We'd already done it with Aberdeen, who are our largest external investor. Um, and this deal was not to do with Aberdeen, but separately, we are able to distribute the BlackRock funds. So we were speaking to them and we decided to put their fund on chain. Now we had a third party investor who wanted to invest some money into the BlackRock fund. So a perfect opportunity. We deployed the money into the fund and we took our holding and we tokenized it on Hedera. That's exactly what we want to hear. Now, where does Onera fit into that picture? So Onera is a distribution channel. So you can come to Archax and you can buy crypto with us directly, buy digital securities with us directly. Onera's proposition is a bit different. They're a router or a router in the industry. So they connect to places like Archax with the hope to help distribute our products. So for us, they're a distribution channel. But if you're somewhere, at, um, let's say a, a private bank and you want access to as many different products as possible, you'll connect into Archax and several others like us in the future. And hopefully through your one connection into Onera, then you'll be able to trade many products. So in this instance, the client actually knew Onera Onera, those are checks. They place their transaction over the Onera network. We received the order and place the transaction. All right. So this is th exactly the kind of infrastructure that we were hoping we were going to see built in the uh, in the industry. You know, when Larry Fink came out and said that you know the future of securities, the future of financial markets was going to be tokenization, we wondered where that would first pop up. What networks were going to be able to facilitate that in a regulatory compliant way. And of course, Archax is one of, if not the only security tokenization platform that has been regulated in the UK. But one of the things that popped up last week that really kind of interests me is when you were clarifying there were claims last week through some media outlets that BlackRock was not involved at all. And as you mentioned, they were involved. They don't necessarily have to be involved, though. So what I'm curious about, Graham, is what else right now could be tokenized on Archax? Could you have you know, other money market funds? Could you have equities? What else could be tokenized using your platform? Yeah, I guess... Um... I mean, the quick summary is everything, you know, all, all regulated securities out there across the world, as long as we can hold them, immobilize them, then we can probably create tokens backed by them. If you think of the way that stable coins work, there's a bunch of fiat sitting in a bank account somewhere and they're issuing tokens backed by that fiat. It's much the same as we do with securities. We've got a regulated custodian. We can hold those securities in CSDs or networks of CSDs or privately, and we can create tokens backed by those assets that are held completely in solvency remote. So there's not many assets out there we can't tokenize uh, it's part of you know what what we see as the future everyone wants tokens and and instruments to exist legally on chain which means they're issued on chain in the first instance but the reality is that that's probably some way away so what we do instead is take the investments that are already out there we put them on the existing rails and then we create tokens which for most intents and purposes operate in exactly the same way as a natively digital instrument so what are the benefits of tokenization as you see it 
Well, I mean, let's take the money market fund as, you know, kind of, I guess the most recent example uh, in the old hedge fund I was at, you know, when you get to the evening, you can put your money in a bank and take bank risk or you can put it in a money market fund. Uh, when you put it in a money market fund, though, you're giving up the flexibility of having that cash. You can no longer use it for transactions. You know, you've got this money market fund, which is, you know, probably a bit more secure in some respects, whereas the beauty of tokenization is you've really got something which has all the advantages of a money market fund, but actually has some of the transferability of cash. So you can use it to satisfy margin obligations. You can use it as your settlement pair when you're trading. You can borrow against it like you do against Aave or Balancer or any of these DeFi protocols. Imagine that you can go somewhere in, in DeFi and you can take your security and you can borrow against it. I mean, that's something a lot of us would like to be able to do, not just the hedge funds that can use stock lending desks. So that's kind of the future that we see and we're building toward. And I think everyone's starting to realize it too. And how about settlement? Does it make things a little bit easier? You know, I know normally when you're settling securities, it takes two days. Does that process still have to take place? Yeah, it does. You know, it's one of those things which, you know, people talk about dynamic settlement a bit too much in crypto, if you, if you like, from my point of view. It's true you can settle things real time, but usually that's when the, the buyer and the seller has the cash and the assets um, and they switch them on chain real time. You know, usually most people don't fully fund transactions in traditional finance. You go through chains of clearing houses and CSDs or wherever it may be. So um, it does help in some respects. You can have it 24 seven, you can have it systematic, but you still need to have the cash and assets there in order to affect it or someone picking up the credit. So I think that'd be a really good, you know, a really good area to watch over the next couple of years, how that settlement time changes. That makes perfect sense. Now, one of the reasons why money market funds have been getting a lot more attention is because the yields have gone up significantly, give or take four and a half, five percent. How are the yields handled for these funds on our checks? Yes, I mean, we pass through most of the yields directly to our clients other than a small fee. So if you're in crypto and, you know, you want to go risk off, then don't sit there with a stable coin. Go to somewhere like Archax, put it in a money market fund. You can have availability on T0, T1 and get the yield in your interest and stay within the tokenization world as well. So, you know, it's part of the part of the use case we're addressing. You know, the stable coins have been great. They're great businesses, but it would kind of bother me as a consumer that someone else is earning interest on my money when I can be getting a decent yield. So I think that's a... You know, that's part of the reason the investment managers are starting there. There's a hundred billion opportunity right there if someone can get it right. Yeah, low hanging fruit. So right now, who are your main customers and how can people and businesses that want to get involved get involved with our checks? Yeah, so we serve institutions mainly for securities, um, but individuals can come to us as well for crypto trading. Uh, we're more targeted at professionals. You can come to our website, rchax.com, for the information there. You can find out more from Matt Grodfather or rchaxx or rchax crypto on Twitter as well. So we're out there in a bunch of places, but if you just come into our website, you'll be able to find more about us. That sounds fantastic. So the next thing I want to ask about is you already mentioned that you have the ability to tokenize pretty much anything, equities, bonds, and so forth. Uh, what's the roadmap look like for Archax over the next several months and years? Yeah, I mean, without getting the Hedera community too excited, you know, I should point out that we're chain agnostic. We try and pick the right chain for we think is appropriate for the product. So um, if someone comes to us as, and chooses a chain, then we go in that direction. Internally, we've got a good relationship with Hedera. We believe in the network. So we pick that for a lot of activity. Uh, we've got about seven other investment managers behind this. So, you know, they represent hundreds of billions of dollars in assets. You, you'll be seeing more of those from us in the future. Um, but we're also starting to work on 24-7 equity, debt, ETFs, other products as well. So you pretty much every asset out there we think is moving on chain. So we're going to try and be in front of most of them. Well, Graham, I'm excited about what you guys have been doing. Congratulations on all the success you've had to this point. Good luck on your roadmap. And thanks for stopping by today and telling us about it. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Now, that was really well covered, but Graham had some additional insights in a Cointelegraph space this past Tuesday that was meant to kind of clear the air and get all the information out around this tokenization. And I wanted to make sure you guys got some of those highlights. BlackRock is such a huge name and the largest asset manager in the world, obviously, that, you know, brings a lot of attention, a lot of eyeballs. And so maybe, Graham, you can just introduce yourself and kind of just give us kind of the play by play of what happened from uh, from your perspective. Yeah, sure. Hey, guys. Good to be here. So, yeah, so Graham, CEO of Archax. So we're a regulated exchange custodian broker in the UK and crypto asset firm as well. So we can pretty much do most things with securities and crypto here. Been around for six years. My background actually slightly related is in fund management. So kind of fully familiar with the way that 
that these structures operate in a traditional world and then you know sometime about six years ago realized that that all of these assets are moving on chain and really now it doesn't seem to be whether that's happening i think everyone's kind of agreed that digital securities rwas they're all coming uh, and they're coming on chain so you know really that's been the vision and the focus of ours and for most of our existence we've been putting together the infrastructure so building the systems, building the tokenization engine, and then developing these relationships. But obviously, we're very commercially driven. So, you know, we have access to many securities. I mean, theoretically, we can tokenize most of the securities on the planet. And in this instance, we had a client come to us uh, that wanted to invest in the BlackRock Money Market Fund. And so we know the BlackRock team. We've been speaking to them for, for a long while, as we have most institutions out there. And from their point of view, we're a client buying into their funds um, and we have this relationship with several other asset managers as well uh, and obviously you guys would have seen in the in the press some while back that Aberdeen Asset Management invested in us and, and we use the same structure with them and that really is that we invest in their fund so from their point of view they see our tracks on their books a record and then on our side we tokenize the owners from our nominees point of view so imagine as a regulated firm we're a bit like a broker you come into our platform you place a trade we buy what you want us to buy and we hold it on your behalf and then we tokenize the beneficial ownerships on our part so we choose the platform for our books and records like any broker chooses the platform for their books and records so it is true that our checks chose to work with Hedera and not BlackRock but it is also true that you know the contractual ownership of that BlackRock fund uh, is on the chain through the Archax um, through the Archax relationship so that's kind of the reality from from the legal point of view and I guess just to add on that a little bit because I think some people myself as well want to see all of these assets existing natively on chain you want to see people creating securities instantly on a blockchain and that being the golden source of truth and for a variety of complicated uh, regulatory and and settlement reasons it becomes quite difficult to do that so whilst it might sound okay these are our taxes records you know that what does that really mean well actually that's the way that a lot of finance works today most of most of the holders of securities out there do through a chain of custodians and this is no difference in this instance and actually under uk regulation the tokens that we've created that we call beneficial ownership tokens or bots they're actually securities in their own right they can be transferred and in the future hopefully they can be used to use as collateral in, in DeFi apps or or be um, be exchanged on a dex between other permission parties so really you know it is a level detached from the investment manager but that doesn't take away from from what we've all achieved here yeah definitely just want to also just to yeah kind of underline that and say you know we're we're really excited and and the news is really exciting to have you know these real world assets uh going on chain uh and i think you know, we here at Cointelegraph, you know, we are very much, you know, we, we, we are reporting on, on these developments and, you know, we're here to support the community with kind of, you know, the, the whole picture. But, you know, the announcement when it was released on X, you know, it seemed that it was misinterpreted and, and in some way, maybe that misinterpretation could have maybe overshadowed, yeah, just kind of how uh, exciting the news is. Uh, we saw the price surge almost 100% from that announcement and i wonder you know what you guys think whether you agree that the uh the foundation's post was a bit misleading in its in its wording and just kind of how you see what happened since then uh and yeah how you how you kind of understand the the kind of uh when when people finally actually kind of figured out okay wait this isn't actually blackrock uh you know this is something else and then there was you know kind of a sell off kind of just your your opinion on what the news is and yeah what you think yeah, I think um, that we there was an agreed press release. That was the that was the release initially. And I think when you're trying to put a lot of these things onto social media, you know, quite often you have to change the phraseology. I think THF did that. Probably the wording wasn't as tight as you know it could have been as in the press release. And then I think that maybe on its own that would have been alright. But then people start interpreting that at their own way, and and you know what Twitter's like, and it gets carried away, and it's impossible to control it. Um, I think if you look at the fundamentals here, um, you know, yes, the entity didn't choose to put their fund on Hedera, but the fund is on Hedera. It was done in a regulated way. We are still seeing real world assets moved on chain. Our checks picked Hedera because we think it's an appropriate place for them to be. Um, and we think it behaves correctly. So, you know, I think your point earlier was the right one is that you know, the news was the news and kind of in the whipsaw action of, you know, what is it really? 
uh, you know, there was actually there was actually something good happening here. My question is for Graham, uh, like for, from the Archex side, why, why did you choose Hedera uh, as a chain to tokenize uh, your assets there? Yeah, hi, thanks. We uh, so, you know, we're we're chain agnostic, but commercially driven, as, as I mentioned. And what that means is that if a client comes to us and says, I want to invest in this security and I want to put it on this chain, as long as we support it, then we, we would do as the client wants. When a client doesn't express an interest, then we keep our books and records in the place that we think most appropriate. Uh, and at the moment, we just think makes sense for a number of reasons. So um, we've always been looking at it for, for six years because of the frequency of transactions required to run an exchange on chain, which is something we kind of aspire to be able to do properly. Hedera or Hashgraph kind of is able to cope with that kind of volume. Uh, so that's one point. Secondly, the governing council. So Aberdeen, you know, our largest external investor there on the governing council. If you look across that governing council, you'll see uh, a whole host of institutions who kind of support and, you know, in some cases, many cases, I'm sure, build on the chain. So there's comfort given at that level. Um, the fixed fees, I think, is a kind of critical point. You don't get this fee fluctuation with network activity. So building business models around it kind of helps certainty. And then the final point really is this kind of permission inside. So, you know, we've seen with other issuances in the past that people can airdrop you, you know, memes, NFTs, kind of tarnished tokens, if you like. Whereas uh, on Hedera, we were able to protect our wallet and permission only tokens that we want to go into it. And also the client can permission to receive tokens as well. So you kind of have these naturally in bit controls that are quite useful so you know we're big fans of the network we're integrated with them and, and in this instance it made sense yeah it makes a lot of sense i don't know if i can ask this maybe you can give us some alpha are you planning on tokenizing any other blackbrook funds anytime soon yeah. um yeah so i can't really say uh, but i'll speak generally so please don't sit take that as any information so um you know not regarding BlackRock and not regarding any specific chain. Our taxes aim is that all assets are moving on chain. And right now we have a bunch of different assets that, that we're looking at. I mean, from Aberdeen's point of view, we have permission to distribute over 70 of their funds. We're regularly looking at them and considering if there's any there that, that would meet a particular demand. So Graham is obviously a great champion for the Web3 space. He's a pioneer for bridging those traditional financial markets over into the Web3 space. And I can't wait to see what more comes out from that. Now I'm going to shift gears here a little bit into Hedera development. We saw a report come out from Santiment that said that Hedera had the third most development activity of all the chains out there. And while I'm really happy to see Hedera so high up on this list, I will say that I think it might even underreport how much development activity is happening on Hedera. Santamon gets all of their information from GitHub, everything that's public. But I think because Hedera has so much enterprise development activity and they keep their stuff under wraps, they might be a lot more quiet around what they're working on. I think there might be a lot more activity going on than even this report shows. But still, it was great to see the public development activity on Hedera so high up on this list. Now we're going to go into Shark Bites. We had some great questions from the community. We had some great insights from Rob particularly around everything that's happening with Australian Payments Plus. So let's check that out. Rob, welcome back. Last week was exciting and it just stayed that way for the rest of the week, but I'm looking forward to this one as well. Welcome back. Yeah, it was a really good week last week, wasn't it? Lots of activity, lots of noise, lots of debate and a great resolution, I feel, thought, at the end of the week. So, um, But this is another week, so let's get into it. <laughs> Certainly a lot of attention. All right, so we'll jump right into them. These might have to be a little bit rapid fire. The first one comes from <laughs> Bodie McBoatface, who asks, is ServiceNow still a governing council member? I had high hopes for a use case from them. Uh, yes, yes, they're a very active governing council member, actually. So we've got Tasca Generis on the uh, board. We've got uh, Shuchi Ran, who's an amazing, amazing lady on the uh, who chairs the marketing committee. She also drives a lot of the ServiceNow kind of value system and, uh, and Guardian integration and sustainability use cases. Nicola Atico has uh, published a lot of um, things online. You know, check out his LinkedIn profile. 
A lot of that was happening in 2022 after they joined. And as is always the case, you build product and then you take product to market and then you start integrating it into your services. And then ultimately they become, you know, either transparent layers that are, you know, widgets within what, what you do or a specific product, which, you know, you no longer talk about Hedera about because, you know, there are uh, stacks and layers of um, value on top of the, uh, the technology choices. But absolutely, yes, they're a, they're a very active uh, governing council member. Looking forward to seeing them producing some more of the, uh, the, the online content around what they're doing. But uh, everything that they, that they have previously done is still um, valid and, um, and actively being kind of brought to market. Well, I think the Guardian ecosystem, our refi ecosystem, it's just going to continue to ramp up. And when we see it, you know, two years down the line, it's going to be unrecognizable compared to what we see today. And I think that's really where we're going to see ServiceNow start to shine in the months yeah. and years to come. I mean, it's not just about that ServiceNow, about business workflows. They're about uh, you know, ERP systems and integration within uh, corporate processes. So, you know, the widgets, the, uh, the capability that Hedera exposes through the consensus service um, to, and the token service are all kind of part and parcel of their, um, of their offering as well. So, you know, and those are selectable by their, their customers. And uh, I'm sure it'll get leveraged over time in, in new and exciting and innovative ways. She, she actually leads the innovation space globally. So she's, um, she's very well placed to be uh, a key advocate and driver of, um, of Hedera, which, which is exactly what she is. Good to hear. Well, we're going to bring it home for you. We're going to go to one from Matt and Hargan who says, Hi, Rob. Can you give us any info on AP plus use cases, Connect ID, Pay2, Beam, etc., and how they tie into Hedera? When do we expect to see live TPS from AP plus? Aaron had a similar one, but this one was from a while ago saying, with regards to Australian Payments Plus, the new organization that Rob has joined, how exactly do they plan on using Hedera? Will they plan on using other cryptocurrencies for this? And when can we expect use cases and activity to start to arrive on the Hedera mainnet? What ballpark TPS or revenue generation can we expect from these use cases? Now, I know in those two questions, Rob, they threw an awful lot at you, but can we get an update on AP+. Yeah, I'm happy to provide an update. But a full disclaimer, there is, there's no alpha here today. Um, I, we're not quite ready to announce um, all the things that we're looking at. But what I, you know, I didn't want to fend off the questions uh, forever until we were ready for a kind of the full announcement. So I kind of wanted to go through some of the, the thinking that we're currently um, um, doing. And maybe a little bit of the backstory uh, for, for AP Plus for those who, who don't know. So I'm, I rejoined the Australian Payments Industry Organization, AP Plus, Australian Payments Plus, back in November. I'd previously been the entrepreneur in residence at FPOS, which is when we joined the Governing Council three years ago, four years ago now, but I joined and then we joined uh, the Governing Council three years ago. And FPOS was merged with all the other payment schemes, domestic payment schemes in, in Australia into this one body, this one company called AP Plus, Australian Payments Plus, which operates all of the payments infrastructure in, in Australia. So we have FPOS, which is the debit card uh, payment scheme. We've got uh, the new payments platform, which is the real-time payments system. And we've got BPay, which is the bill payment system. But in, in addition to that, we've got other digital businesses such as Connect ID, which is the business I built when I was previously at FPOS, which is a digital identity platform for Australia. We have Beam, which is a, um, a consumer wallet, and we have QR services and, and a range of other things that are kind of uh, adjacent to the, that kind of um, operation of the core payments rails for Australia. So it's a big deal. And so it's a, a big business and it's critical infrastructure for, for Australia. So when I had rejoined, in, and we, we joined the Governing Council three years ago after a, a series of proofs of concept, which were focused around micropayments. In my view, and a lot of this is my view, and so don't take it as you know kind of the corporate line, but in my view, there is a very definite, clear, kind of greenfield space at the, you know, adjacent to existing payments infrastructure, let's call it Web2 payments infrastructure, that which has been developing over decades. And this greenfield actually 
enables micropayments. It's uh, it's kind of I'm a payments guy. I've been pa building payment systems for you know, nearly thirty years, and no one has really cracked the micropayments kind of uh, nut yet. And this is why I was attracted to Hedera in the first place. In 2017, we were looking for highly scalable, very low cost payments rails. Um, blockchains just weren't cutting it. And then Hedera, um, I was introduced to Lehman and Mance and um, everything else, you know, followed. So my view is that this, this greenfield space is, um, is perfectly ready now for for highly scalable distributed ledger technology. And when we when we did the proofs of concept in uh, you know, three years ago, the the use cases we were looking at was just like just that. You know, how do we pay for streamed content or pay per page or pay per track or pay per you know small unit of value? And how do you stream the value in the same way as you're streaming the content? It's a really interesting and innovative move away from subscription models or ad models or you know the the other payment style online payment style um, mechanisms which have been have evolved over the last you know sort of 10 15 20 years so that's what we were looking at it went so well we were um, invited to join the governing council and I was honored to be on the governing council in my first kind of stint what then happened was that FPOS merged with the rest of these other payment schemes driven by the, the in industry as a whole and the Reserve Bank of Australia to optimize costs. And we kind of went dark for a couple of, couple of years as the, as the organization, you know, had to reorganize. It had to, um, bring together these, these different parties and change the operating model and everything. But it, it took a couple of years to do that during that time. We continue to to run proofs of concept, to test Tadera's capability, to look at more experiential um, aspects rather than the, the the technological infrastructural aspects, and you know things like reward points or donations or roundups or you know the consumer uh, interactions which we are all familiar with, but but can be enabled and um, really enhanced through the application of you know of uh, DLT and Hedera in this case. So those were going on in the background. And um, in November, I was invited to rejoin this newly formed organization um, to head up the Web3 strategy. So since then, things that I've been doing are actually establishing AP Plus's role in a Web3 future. You know, in a world full of blockchains and DLT and stable coins and central bank digital currencies, where we have changing regulatory environments across the world and, and in, in Australia in particular for us, where we have a member organization, our schemes are member-based. So we've got all the banks, uh, we've got the, the main retailers, the Woolworths and Coles, we've got 150 members across our schemes. So lots of, lots of big corporate businesses and smaller you know, fintech players, all kind of collaborating in this kind of safe space, which is the scheme. So our thinking is actually that our, the, our role to play is, is scheme based. But what does a scheme look like in, in the Web3 space? It doesn't, it's not the same as a scheme, a closed shop, if you like, in, in Web2. So those are the, those are the things that we're, um, we're look, now looking at and are going to be experimenting with. And, you know, I've made some proposals and we'll see how those kind of play out over the next few months. Well, we can tell there's a lot going on. It, it doesn't matter if a, it's a small business through medium-sized businesses, but particularly for those large enterprises, you really need a champion when you're building on these DLTs. And, and we couldn't ask for a better champion in you at AP Plus, Rob. Thank you. All right. So the next one we're going to get into is from Raf. He says, question for you and Rob. I want to know why the white paper isn't updated. There was still info about Hashgraph being patented. So really, a lot of people and companies think that Hashgraph is an open source. That's really damaging for onboarding companies and retail investors. Also, there's old employees like Jordan Freed in it. Why isn't this done? Thanks. So, Rob, I always kind of thought that white papers were a proposal, not necessarily a living document, but I haven't really thought about it that much. Is this something that should be updated or kept the way it is for posterity and then the updates are captured in other documents? How do we look at white papers in general? 
It is interesting, isn't it? White papers are, in many ways, just as you've said, it's, it's the proposal that gets you to that kind of starting line. It's an artifact. I mean, it's actually a very good, uh, the, the uh, Hedera Hashgraph white paper is a very good artifact um, that demonstrates the founder's thinking at a point in time. Um, but of course, we, we evolve all the time. So, you know, just look at the roadmap, look at the changes. The, the, the white paper didn't envisage a Hedera consensus service or a token service. It had, you know, a core set of services that it proposed. But now over time, we've kind of discovered that there are better, not better services, there are other services which are, that resonate more with the, the community or with the, the ecosystem and, and the users. We've got a roadmap of change over, um, you know, the, the foreseeable future which uh, means that it's, it's an ever, ever changing, ever changing document. So one could think that the white paper is that baseline and then all the additive changes through the roadmap over time, all the other content that's provided is the Delta on top of that. Now, I know that's not very helpful when you want a single point to go to and say, give me the summary of everything that is, that is, um, uh, Hedera. But that's probably the website. It's probably not the white paper anymore. Um, it would be a, a an ongoing job like painting the fourth bridge or the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, as soon as you get to the end, you have to start from the beginning again. So it's probably not a good use of uh, of someone's time to do that. However, I, I, I can see the uh, the questioner's point around individuals who are no longer around and concepts which have been superseded by by others so uh, i don't i don't have an answer uh, maybe maybe the new chief marketing officer will have a have an idea because I, I know that christian was the the arbiter of um, you know the documentation around this so maybe maybe that's something that we could kind of refresh or change but it, i don't think it's high on our priority list of things to do well, it's certainly something that we can follow up on. Hmm. All right, so the next one comes from HBAR10, who says, Hey, Rob, I've seen people say that HCS transactions are too cheap and the cost should be increased so we get more revenue. I'm the opposite. And in fact, I believe HCS will actually only get cheaper over time as the flagship service and gateway drug to Hedera. What do you think? I'm of the opinion, uh, like Goldilocks, uh, HCS is just right. One hundredth of a US cent is a very resonant price for a for a transaction it's obviously just the consensus service there's a lot of debate of course about whether you know revenue um should be you know drawn mainly from hcs i think like we talk about many times we've got the token service we've got the smart contract service there's a mix of services and use cases and capability on top of those which kind of blend the revenue at the moment, we've got uh, a large proportion of um, Hedera consensus service uh, transactions, which means the revenue is kind of at that level. But as things scale, um, I think one hundredth of a US, US cent for that, one, one tenth of US cent for most of the Hedera token service um, transactions. You know, they're nice round numbers. And um, when I'm talking to corporates, though, you know, the forecasting around those specific numbers are very uh, easy to understand and very easy to predict and forecast. Now, of course, the, the governing council can vote to change these, um, um, these prices on the, the network fees. And I don't rule out them doing it in the future, but I've not heard any uh, debate around the consensus service changing. Some of the more expensive network transactions may need to be revisited over time. The ones that kind of use a lot of memory or use a lot of storage, uh, depending on how, you know, the, the different use cases develop um, on Hedera. But, um, but for now, I think the, um, the, the, the rate card, if you like, for those transactions are, um, are just right. I think we get up to scale and reevaluate at that point. Absolutely. All right, the next one's pretty fun. It comes from Space Chick Crypto, who asks, who is his favorite governing council member and why? Now, of course, AP Plus, you're going to lean in that direction, but we've already covered that in fairly good detail. So are there any other council members that are working on things that, that you're really interested in? Um, I took Space Chick's uh, question to be individuals on the council, but so uh, we should probably steer sure. away from that. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, you shouldn't have favourite children, should you? Um, but, but we do. Uh, 
I I obviously like the uh, the governing council members that are vocal advocates of um, of Hedera, and are who are building on the platform. Clearly, the founders are and uh, and Swirls are um, we're all there because of them. We're all there because of Manson Lehman. So those have got to be top of the list. Aberdeen, you know, Duncan Moyer is is one of the uh, most balanced, articulate, and uh, huge proponents of what they are doing in the Hedera ecosystem. <clears throat> I always love listening to him. Can't uh, can't wait to um, to to catch up with him uh, in New York next week. Uh, because we have a governing council meeting then, so we'll all be kind of uh, getting together, and uh, there's there's plenty to talk about. There's plenty to to of decisions to be made. So uh, I'm looking forward to Duncan's view on all of that. There are some um, kind of some governing council members who I probably shouldn't name, but who are moving ahead on their use cases that I'm very you know I'm very excited about because they are. Great use cases. They're great proponents of the um, of the technology, and um, you know, will soon be, I think, the um, some of the poster children of uh, the Hedera network. Um, and the newcomers. I mean, I lo- love the newcomers. So you know, the Hitachi, uh, BitGo, and Mondelez in particular uh, use cases are are great. They've they've come to the table with um, you know ready to go use cases, and uh, you know all. All fired up and um, wanting to um, get stuck in, so um, I can't. You know, we've got thirty-two governing council members, so I mean, I can't pick uh, pick favourites. But just off the top of my head, those who I'm engaging with at the moment, those who I'm um, enjoy participating um, in in debate and discussion with. Uh, we mentioned Shu Chi and ServiceNow earlier. Shu Chi is a wonderful lady, and all the others I've forgotten who will probably shoot me next week. <laughs> well, I will say that I'm with you. I think some of the new council members are really interesting. I'm interested in what to see what BitGo comes out with. Also, mm. Mondelez and more uh, around SKUX, really. It's just that uh, Mondelez brings that tremendous scale that can happen once we start to see those promotions and, and those payment uh, solutions come to fruition. So e- either way, I want to see what they're all going to do. But those are a couple that, that I certainly am excited about. All right. So the last one for today, Rob, comes from Hen the H Bar, who says, Hi, Brandon and Rob. I wonder if it could be possible to somehow specify beneficiaries on our wallets. It could offer peace of mind and protection for our assets in unforeseen circumstances. What are your thoughts? I assume by this question, um, the, the, the questioner is saying, can we identify from a succession or a, you know, an estate planning perspective who to, um, who, who the, 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 the ownership of thing the- that pop- popped into my mind, Rob, was DREC, DREC right? Because if, if you had, yeah, if you had, you know, a group of credit unions or a, a group of uh, validators that could then know who your beneficiary is and mm-hmm. then uh, be able to go th- follow through with that. I, that's the direction that I went with this question. Yeah. And, and, and I, I'm exactly the same. So with DREC, you know, you have your, your secrets, your, your key to your wallet, you can choose who then uh, those secrets are. Uh, you know, the se- secrets are carved up, fractionalized, and then passed to you know a range of people. So that's effectively doing what the questioner wants. You know, if you choose your beneficiaries to be the the holders of the secret, then they have access to the the keys, right? And that may be, and one of them may be your lawyer or your uh, the administrator of your estate or the person with power of attorney or, or whoever, you know, that has that last piece of the puzzle that brings them all together. And then, you know, coupled with your will, you know, the, 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 the wallet passes to that person. So it's very, it would be very uh, straightforward to do that. Um, I'm not, I'm not aware of any way of enabling DREC within the wallets that we currently have, but maybe that's something that is being worked on as well. I know that, um, Bank Social are working with Secura to uh, to implement this. So um, I haven't seen what that looks like yet, but um, um, some of the wallets may follow suit as well. But it's a great question, and it's something that's on on my mind every time I you know, move my my mouth tokens or my Grail token, or, which I have a few of now, um, or um, or my my H bar into um, between wallets. I need to be sure that. Um, you know, my family get the benefit of it if I am, um, if I, you know, when I'm no longer around. 
Yeah, I, I think the fact that we're talking about it and thinking about it, it is possible. We already see the direction that it could go down. Yeah, Rob, absolutely. thank you so much for coming on today uh, and answering these questions. We got some really good questions this week, but next week, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to talk because you are going to be at that governing council meeting. We can't wait to hear exactly what comes out of that. Again, thanks for swinging by and good luck at the meeting. Thank you. Probably uh, the following week, we'll have plenty to talk about. Next up, I want to get into some of our airdrop teams. First, we're going to go to Earthling. So they've had their first three H-bar weighted airdrops. They have gone off without a hitch. Now what they're doing is they're shifting over from the PH Steam, what was to represent their eventual in-game currency, Steam. They are making that swap over. So any of the NFTs that you got that have Steam that are represented, you're going to be able to swap those in. In addition, you're going to be able to take your PH Steam that you either got through their drip on their website for their NFTs or through these airdrops and swap them for Steam. And now we're going to get active markets. We're going to get active DeFi markets like on SaucerSwap. We're also going to get a centralized exchange with MEXC. Now, of course, this isn't financial advice, but I hold a fair amount of Steam. And for me, I'm not even going to think about selling any of this until their product comes to market. I'm very confident in that Earthlings team for bringing a great gaming metaverse to market. I'm looking forward to playing it with my kids. And until I understand exactly how Steam is going to be used in this space, I'm not going to part with a single one. Another one we had was from The Mouth. I was really excited about this one. It went off without a hitch. It happened this past Monday. They integrated some additional features for this one, including supporting their own token holders. They introduced a mechanism for people that are keeping their H-bar on hardware wallets like Ledger to participate as well. And they're also using this airdrop to help boost their social media metrics. So you can go ahead and join their Telegram groups. You can go ahead and follow them on X to get some additional airdrops coming our way. Way. Now let's shift gears over into the Hedera Governing Council. In January of this year, Hitachi was added as a new Governing Council member. And we got some hints as to what they were thinking about as far as working on the Hedera network, but we didn't have any details. We got some details this week in a gossip about gossip where they talked about exactly what they're planning on working on. So let's listen to some highlights around that. And I came back to office and I said, guys, you got to look at this digital ledger technology, right? Forget the cryptocurrency part of it. If you want to participate, good. If you don't want to, look at the technology, under, underlying technology. And uh, they got expo we got exposed to the use cases, met the other council members. Very impressive. And more so, you know, we got exposure to what they're developing. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, it grew after that. Yeah, look, once you want to participate, you want to go full hog. Okay? <laughs> there, is, there is no such thing, you know, participating from a distance. Yeah. It, it doesn't work there. You got to dirty your hands. You got to come down there. You got to contribute. You got to participate. So after we first got introduced to Hedera, our researchers started evaluating the te technology, right? And we're very impressed by the technology as well as uh, all the big names. And then when we met more customers of yours that were big name, and these were geographically uh, dispersed, we started saying, okay, what are the use cases that we are developing? And we being an industrial organization, we had a need for distributed ledger technology for our use cases. Then now it becomes easier for us to develop these use cases. And when we go and talk to our customers and talk about technology, although at the end of the day, we are solving a business problem, but the customers always want to know, okay, how are we going to solve that business problem? That's so right. That, it helps. Let me explain you through a few use cases that we are developing for our big customers. Now, these are uh, around material traceability uh, use cases. Material traceability is important in uh, sustainability and carbon reduction uh, solutions. Now, these use cases, although I'll explain you a little later, have always existed, not there anything new in the industry. However, they were not being adopted at a wide scale, and there were two factors that were slowing down the speed. The first was a regulatory compliance. So lately, the government and there's a government and social pressure to be sustainable uh, and recycle material. Right. The second is that uh, these use cases required the digital ledger technology. It requires 
all participants of the ecosystem or value chain to participate together, which without digital ledger technology, they could not do earlier. Only the big players could participate, right? right. Now, people like you have brought DLT that enables participation. And it's not just regulatory compliance. They have a big ROI. They solve big problems. So let me give you some one or two examples that may help you as to why we are going after the digital ledger technology. The, the first use case is being uh, material traceability in circular economies. We have Hitachi Energy that manufactures uh, uh, electrical equipment such as transformers. They use copper. Now, in the past, it was very difficult to trace back copper and get back and use it in remanufacturing transformers. That has changed. Rather than buying all new copper, electrical companies are now looking for ways to bring back old used copper and recycle it. Now, that's a huge saving and a huge reduction in, uh, it helps our customers get carbon credits. Now, the use case offers significant financial and business benefits too, driving sustainability, efficiency, compliance, and innovation, while opening new avenues for revenue and market differentiation. So if you have time, I can uh, explain you with more use cases. Okay, so, you know, by recycling this copper that I was talking about in products like transformers, not just transformers, it could be any electrical equipment and it could be any material, companies can reduce the new need to buy new material, right? Which is yeah. often a significant expense due to fluctuating market prices. So implementing traceability system reduces waste improves the efficiency of the supply chain, and of course, uh, lowering the operational costs. So, uh, you know, recycling material not only conserves the resources, but also provides an additional revenue stream for the customers. So all this is possible through digital ledger technology, and we love what you are bringing to the table for us over here. So I'll give you another very important use case which we are doing for... Uh, another of our customer, and that is in the EV battery industry. You know, the world is adopting EV to be sustainable. Yeah. But what about the batteries that go in there? It's a big challenge, and they use material that is rare. And it is very costly to mine things like uh, cobalt and lithium. Uh, so one of our customers, which is a battery, EV battery manufacturer, is looking for a solution to trace back these minerals and bring them back. Now, they can use these material to be able to either rebuild the batteries, or even uh, you know, bring back the elements that go into the battery manufacturing back to their elemental form and sell them. Actually, there's a lot more profit in selling the elements and remanufacturing or totally brand new manufacturing of batteries. And so, so they want to they want to prove sort of the provenance of those materials and sort of the life cycle of those materials. Exactly, okay. exactly. Rather than letting this material go bad, uh, I mean, go waste. Right. How do you bring it back? Yeah. And to bring it back, you need traceability, yeah. and not just traceability once in a while. You need the traceability in the entire supply chain throughout the life cycle. So two things are important: the supply chain as well as the entire life cycle of the battery. Right. All right. And in order to do that, you need all the supply chain partners to participate and therefore the blockchain. Okay. All right. And therefore your digital ledger technology. Now, you know, it, it does a lot of good to our customers because the use, these use cases, they position our customers as a leader in sustainable practices with right. the, within the electrification ecosystem. Uh, you know, they appeal to the environmentally conscious customers and stakeholders, carbon credits, and of course, new avenues for revenue, right? That That is very, very critical. And then, of course, you know, this evolving regulation that is evolving around the battery recycling and sustainability, all right, it, it plays a big role there to be compliant with the regulatory compliances, right? So th these are good use cases, and I can go on and on. There are a lot more use cases. For example, you know, people talk about the reduction in carbon footprint. Uh, um, you know, when you have uh, scope one and two, it's easy to monitor. The moment you get into the scope three emissions, 
which means you have to monitor the entire supply chain and every participant in the supply chain and see what kind of carbon are they producing or carbon footprint they're saving, depending on how you see it. Uh, it is important that we trace the carbon being saved or generated at each stage. And again, your digital ledger technology comes in. I hope that answers your question, why DLT technology? I love long, it. Long winding answer to your small question. So it's great to see that kind of passion for building on the Hedera network coming out of the Hitachi team. Now, the last thing that I want to cover before we get into network analysis is from the Tomb Technologies team. Of course, we know they've worked a lot on MetaMask snaps, and they've added some additional features. The one that really caught my eye is for atomic swaps. Of course, I'm always a huge supporter of the Hedera wallets out there, Kabila and Walla Wallet, Hashpack and Blade. But for those that are more familiar with other ecosystems, to come in through the MetaMask system certainly makes sense. So all the work and the features that are being added by Tomb are invaluable. And with that, we'll go ahead and get into some network analysis. The Hedera network processed well over a billion transactions this week with an average of about 1,900 transactions per second and a max TPS of 5,200. And of course, these are real value-add transactions for real use cases, not fluff. We did see OKX put out a post highlighting high volume networks, conveniently leaving out Hedera. They left out Algorand as well, but H barbarians like Tata were at the gate and set the record straight. When discussing who the king of transaction volume is, I've had a few community members from ICP say that they're processing a lot. I'm not sure of the use case, but I go to the list on Chainspec since they've already set some standards around this. And that still has Hedera at the top. Looking at the time to consensus finality, it looks like they tweaked something midweek that caused a slight improvement and is now sitting at just over 3.5 seconds. We've also created about 26,000 accounts over the past seven days. Moving down to our fungible tokens, Wrapped HBAR takes the top spot, USDC moved to number two on the list, followed by Dovu, Saucer Swap's native sauce token, Karate, Energy Trade token, the bridge version of USDC, the meme coin Unlucky, Jam, and H Suite. Looking at our NFTs, the 2024 Road Code Access card took the top spot, followed by the Saucer Swap Liquidity token. Next up is Peculiar Peeps and the Doctor Who Worlds Apart NFT. And I really like to see that Doctor Who token making a good showing. At number five, we have the Times, followed by the Slime World NFT. And by the way, I think that interview with the Nada team that brought us Slime World will happen next week. We also have H Suite's liquidity token, a couple of Lithos Rant CPU NFTs, and finally the Baxter ID NFT from Mio. I also have a couple NFT related shout outs. First for Hashgraph Online for introducing standards for dynamic hashnals. Hashnals are NFTs where all the data for the file is stored on graph as opposed to pointing to a file stored elsewhere like IPFS and dynamic indicating the metadata can be updated. This has pretty cool implications for my company Twigital, so I'm going to keep a really close eye on it and hopefully our team can implement it. And also a shout out to Hunger Fighters for using Hedera NFTs as a force for good, providing meals to those in need in Chicago. And with that, we'll take a look at DeFi. Taking a look at DeFi Llama, we are back over $100 million in TVL in the Hedera DeFi ecosystem. 98 million of that is from SaucerSwap, 5 million from HSuite, and 2 million from Heliswap. Moving over to the HBAR and crypto markets, Bitcoin is down over 3% on the week, but up 5% on the day to $62,000. In general, crypto has struggled this week, but HBAR has outperformed being up slightly on the week and has had a great day. With HBAR sitting at 11.1 .1 cents, we're up nearly 14% over the past 24 hours. One of the best technical analysts in the crypto space, Credible Crypto, said in an ex post this morning that if we can reclaim the range lows that have acted as resistance on price since losing them, we may be ready for our ascent back to over 20 cents. Those range lows were at 11 cents, so we have managed to get a bit above that level. So now the question is if we can hold that level as support. While I would love to look towards 20 cents, I think 14 cents could offer some resistance as well. So that is an area to keep an eye on. 
So a few updates for next week. Chris, the Cardano community member that was kind of at the center of the controversy around the Archax news that came out. We had agreed to do a space to kind of talk that out. He's opted not to do that. I don't want to put any pressure on him. We'll just let sleeping dogs lie. So that's going to be canceled. (laughs) So I'm also doing that interview with John from Bank Social, as well as James from Connects, who are working together to bring us that Defy Web3 credit union. And again, I'm talking with the team from Nada. That is the gaming team out of South Korea that's responsible for bringing us Slime World. I'm really looking forward to hearing the story behind that team. Also, next Thursday at noon Eastern, we're going to have Alex Russman. He is the head of the Consumer Engagement Fund at the HBAR Foundation. He's going to come on along with the team from Mio to tell us about some of the luxury brands that they're working with. That's pretty much all we have. We'll see you next week.